Chapter 9. The test became more and more peculiar as I flipped through the pages. About 10 pages had blank maps to fill in. A map of the continent was labeled for the current year. Since borders had been shifting with the advance of Titia, I added last month before the year. I shaded all of the Skaven lands as part of Titia. I named the southern states, the small countries to the west and south of Erebern that blocked their sea axis as best I could. A map of the whole world was labeled the greatest historical extent of Soferend. I shaded in most of where we are now with more Tissian provinces included and then the colonies all over the world. We didn't have colonies anymore. We'd given them up, granted freedom to those lands and focused on life at home. After the maps were questions or instructions, describe the origins of Soferend. All of us knew that. The ancient and medieval Aeleans and Norlanders and Soferers sailed to each other's lands and blended so that Soferenders are, were descended from those peoples too. We spread into southern parts of Soferend, like where we lived, that were more mountainous and mixed with people, mountain peoples there too. The peoples who are on other mountains became Tissians or Arobans. We were strong because we were made of everyone. All the provinces voted to be one country under one seafarer flag a hundred years ago. How did the current war come about? I jotted down how Tissia had taken the Skaven kingdoms one by one. Soferend and Eileen had pledged to defend the Skaves if anything like that had happened, so we had to fight. Then Tissia joined with Aeroburn and started attacking us. Next came pages and pages of patterns, numerical, geometric, lyrical, musical, without directions. I continued each or wrote down what I noticed. Then there was a whole page that was a jumble of letters, like a word find puzzle. I circled some words I found in the lines, but I didn't know if I could look backward and diagonally too, or change direction made word, or if I could just use the jumble of letters to create words. So I just circled words every which way until the paper was crammed full of circles, and then I started listing on the side. I concentrated so hard I forgot I was taking a test. I turned the page and went completely still. Number 326. How do aerials stay up? Number 327. When flying at 10,000 feet and 350 miles per hour toward a target with a load to drop, when should you drop the load to hit the target? Was this what the whole test was about after all? Were they looking for kids to fly aerials? Were these the only questions in the booklet that mattered? I didn't want to fly aerials. I didn't want to drop bombs on people. I looked at the first question again. I had no idea what, air, what kept aerials up, so I just wrote engines, propellers, wings, air pressure. As for the second question, I didn't know how to do those kind of calculations. I figured that the load would be moving forward like the aerial itself, so I wrote, before you get there. Suddenly, Caleb got up, his chair scraping loudly on the wooden floor. He walked to the front of the room, handed in his booklets, and left. We stared after him. In the next few minutes, other boys started handing in their exams, too. Maybe they had just been waiting for someone to be brave enough to go first. How had they decided they were done? Had they answered everything they knew? Or were they just tired of answering? I didn't think I had answered enough yet. As I flipped through the remaining pages, the questions became more and more random. Draw and label a sound fortress. That was actually something I could do, though I wondered which country's features they wanted me to use. I decided the key word was sound. I could pull from any tradition as long as it made a good fortress. Hmm, I drew. You are packing a picnic lunch for a friend. What do you include? What was this, a chance to show I knew proper nutrition? Then why wouldn't they ask for a whole week's meals? Bread, meat, cheese, fruit. Then something else occurred to me. So I wrote, that depends on what my friend likes to eat. Suddenly, someone was crying from a few seats back and to my right, Megs. She flew up the aisle and out the door. She wouldn't be allowed back in. That was the rule. I ran into the hallway. Megs? I found her down the hall, back against the wall, knees drawn up. The examiner's assistant approached her, but, she, but when she heard my footsteps, she paused. 
She nodded at me and returned to the classroom door. The examiner poked her head into the hallway, saw me crouching down to talk to Megs, gave me a stern, searching look, and shut the door. We were officially done with the test. Relief washed through me, warm as sunshine. But Megs? She had her arms drawn up over her head, which was resting on her knees. I put a hand on her shoulder, but she flinched and drew in her breath as if it burned. Megs, it's just me. She was crying too hard to answer, so I sat down next to her. Finally, Meg said, what am I gonna tell mother? What will she say? She's gonna be so disappointed. I couldn't finish it. I tried and tried, but it was like I would never finish. How had she not seen? You weren't meant to finish, no one was. She looked at me through her fingers. Really? Why didn't I notice that? You were probably so focused you didn't see. I bet you still did great. I bet you answered enough to show how smart you are. You really think that's possible? Of course I do. I bet everything you wrote down was, was perfect. Something caught in my throat and I stopped talking. Meg stopped crying and looked up. My being unable to continue was to Meg's what father's saving for the coins had been to me. His saving confirmed that he thought I wouldn't make it. My crying confirmed that I believed she would go. She would go and I would never see her again. Miss Tamarin walked down the hallway. All done, girls? Her eyes scanned our red, puffy ones. We nodded. That's a relief, then. We nodded. Have a good night. I'll be glad to have you back tomorrow. No one wanted to answer my questions without you, Megs. Oh, Mathilde, did you know you have blue paint on your ear? I reached up to feel both my ears. They must have glowed pink with embarrassment. Good night, girls. Good night, Miss Tamarin. Meg seemed calmer. I stood in front of her, presenting both hands, and she took them. Hers were still wet with tears, hard to hold on to as she stood up. At dinner, Cammie pushed her chair close to mine. We kept bumping elbows as we cut our meat and carrots. When Mother turned to get something from the stove, I poured half my milk into Cammie's glass. How was it, Big? Hmm? What was the best thing to say? That I'd walked out of the test to follow Meg's when maybe I could have done more? They probably wouldn't be too impressed by that. I answered a lot of questions. What kinds of things did they ask you? Father asked. Math, translations, patterns. So you think it went well? You let me go with blue paint on my ear. It suited you, Mother said. The corners of her mouth twitched into a smile. Suddenly, Father and I were smiling too. The glowing candlelight, no electricity tonight, seemed to flicker inside me as well, warm and soothing. A shred of darkness remained, like that creeping in through the windows between the curtains. Megs would be going away.